Hi, this is Ryan Gill with the Hunt Primitive Podcast, where we talk about all things hunting primitive. And today we are joined by a very accomplished primitive hunter, R.D. Easterling. And uh, today we're just going to be talking about, I believe, some bear hunting on, I imagine, coastal Alaska. Is that correct? Ryan, it was actually up above Anchorage. Um, it was in the Copper Center. So uh, we were more inland than on the coastal. Okay. All right. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. I guess some grizzly bears and black bears and probably also lead into some other things that RD has done. And basically, if you're new to the Hunt Primitive channel, uh, we talk all things Hunt Primitive where we entertain, educate, and inspire. So we hope that you will either... Crack a beer if you're sitting at home and sit back and listen, or if you're driving, you know, put us on and put on some headphones and listen to, you know, the good stories that are to come. And hopefully we can also learn some things, not just uh, from our successes, but also from our failures. So with that, I would like to ask um, RD, what makes you interested in hunting primitive? Or what makes you hunt primitive? You know, Ryan, that's an interesting question. It's uh, different things for different people, I believe. But for me, it started years ago. Um, it's really um, a way for me to connect to a part of my heritage. My grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee. So that's what started me on this journey to be able to um, experience the way of life as they knew it five or 600 years ago as much as possible knowing that in today's modern world that we only get a very small glimpse. But part of what I do is to try to recreate the same um, experience that they had with primitive hunting pre-Columbia contact. Okay, that's great. And uh, yeah, I know the reasons that, that you do it are different. You know, like you said, everybody's reasons for doing it is different. Like for me, obviously, this it was never supposed to be an occupation, uh, but that's what it turned into for me. And I, I wouldn't change that for the world now because I absolutely love what I do. But I think one of the most important things about this podcast and the future episodes is that this can be a collection of not only stories, but a collection of recounts and data. So for all these stories that I can compile from other primitive hunters, not just in their successes, but also their failures, we can start putting together a pattern of what works and what doesn't work, as opposed to, say, just me going out and hunting all the time. I'm just one variable in the grand scheme of things when it comes to primitive hunting. Uh, but we can have you as a guest on the show, and we're going to talk about, you know, your equipment, how you make it, um, you know, all the specifications behind it that are not only unique to you, but would be, you know, valuable uh, in the overall knowledge realm, if you will, on uh, primitive hunting. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we can capture all of that for everybody. Um, so tell me, uh, or tell everybody else, I guess even me, I, I know some of the stuff that you've done, but, uh, give us just a couple highlights of some of the, the hunts that you've done with primitive bows and, and, uh, stone points. And then go ahead and tell us about some of the gear on that too. Just take it and run with it. Good. Um, absolutely, Ryan. First of all, um, uh, we talked about why I do what I do, but I think most important or whether you're hunting with primitive equipment, traditional, whatever it is that you're hunting with, is to be able to enjoy what God created for us. That's what means most to me. And then it's a journey of being able to connect to my heritage. Some of the animals that I've hunted, um, some of my highlights have been the black bear because it was such a vital animal to the uh, life of the um, the life of my my people and uh, my ancestors, uh, just as the buffalo was to the Sioux Indians, the black bear was to the Cherokee. So uh, I've been very blessed to take several black bear. Uh, I've taken a nice bull elk. I've taken a number of um, white-tailed deer, um, a Sitka, and um, Corsican ram. And um, I've 
I had some experience with a buffalo also, a bison. You and I have talked about doing something of that nature in the future together. So that's just some of the game that God's blessed me to be able to pursue and actually have some success with taking these animals, Ryan. That's that's great. And actually, I would like to go back and touch on uh, more for uh, especially folks that are going to be as interested as I am as, of hearing that as to why the black bear was so essential to the Cherokee peoples. You know, that was, um, obviously we know that they were primarily from Tennessee, North Carolina. So if you look in the Plains area, the, um, the bison is what was uh, indicative to that area. And uh, the Sioux, um, the Pawnee, different tribes, that's what sustained life right. of them. Obviously, in the Tennessee, North Carolina area and surrounding areas, probably up in the Kentucky, the black bear was very, very prominent. So not only did it provide food for them, and if you've never tried black bear, if you've never eaten black bear, if it's done correctly, it's a very delicious food. I believe in trying to um, use every part of the animal that I can. So not only did it provide food, the hides were uh, used for blankets, clothing, um, the, um, the sinew of the animal was used. Um, so every part of that animal was used as much as possible, just like the Sioux did with the, with the bison ride. Right. Yep. Makes, makes perfect sense. And I do know that the bison did come even as far south as Florida and as far east as, you know, as the coast. But of course, that was in much, much earlier times, um, you know, paleo times. And then everything started, I guess, to recede back, especially as man colonated more and more. Um, and I would wager to guess that the black bear would have been, you know, so important because they're simply easier to hunt than deer also i mean you can get in on a bear you know easier than a deer for sure and obviously they certainly killed and ate deer uh, but i imagine your opportunities to kill a bear especially if they're very um if there's a lot of a lot of them in the area it's much like pig hunting today i guess you know to what we have which they didn't have back then obviously until the spanish brought them along but i feel like you can sneak up on a pig and you can sneak up on a bear a heck of a lot easier than you can sneak up on a deer. Absolutely. Uh, the black bear, obviously, they don't have good eyesight. Now, their smell is tremendously good, and they have a pretty adequate hearing also. But there's a couple of methods. Um, spot and stalk, when they come out in the springtime, Ryan, they're, uh, they're eating grasses to get their system going. So anywhere that you can find some green grass growing, that's where you're going to find black bear in the spring of the year. Great opportunity to do a spot and stalk. But also, uh, black bear in certain areas are legal to bait. And if you go back and do a little research, uh, at least um, my ancestor, ancestors would use honey burns to attract bear. So that, in essence, it's an attractant they would use to bring the animal into them. Uh, and... For us as primitive hunters, I think it's about how, for us, how close can we get to the game? Because our distance is, is very limited versus a compound hunter. As with a compound hunter or the modern hunter, it's more of how far can I shoot an animal? But for us, it's how close can we get to that animal? And there's nothing more exciting than having a black bear within three yards of you and being able to interact with that animal and watch him in his environment uh, there's nothing that can describe, describe this until you're able to experience that ride. Yeah, a hundred percent. I completely agree with that. I mean, there's, that's, uh, that's the whole reason for sure that I do it is it, is it brings a whole nother level of challenge into the hunt. And certainly without any doubt that primitive peoples baited animals in, I mean, that's when you, when you rely upon these game species for food to live on you're not looking to do it in a as much of a sporting fashion as much as an efficiency uh, fashion 
Uh, and I think kind of when we recreate what we're doing today, it's not it's not solely to get it as easy as we can, but there's certain things that we may consider doing that would get us closer to the game for sure. Uh, and then there's just that paradigm between authenticity and challenge. And you have to find where the two intersect, wherever is comfortable for you. And there's not a defined line there for anybody. Some people are perfectly fine um, you know, hunting right directly over bait and shooting something with a primitive bow and that's their choice and there's positively nothing wrong with that and then there's other people that are like nope I have to kill it spot and stock even though the native peoples really probably didn't you know spot and stock deer very often um, but that to them is what makes it exceptionally more challenging yet so I guess really there's no right and wrong way to do it um, but the primitive weapon, as you said, it just requires you to get as close to the animal as possible. So as I've often said before, shooting 40 yards makes you a good shot. Uh, shooting 10 yards makes you a good hunter. Hmm. That's a good point. And um, when we're talking about what um, even the Cherokee, when you when you look at the and I'm using the Sioux because that's a tribe that we're so uh, familiar with. <clears throat> Look out in the plains and out west, we know that uh, there were buffalo jumps. So they're driving animals off cliffs to kill them. Now, in today's time, we would certainly not consider that very sporting. But we also have to realize why were they hunting game? It was for to eat. It was to sustain their life. Although it is very different for us, for you and I, we are still, as primitive hunters, we are doing this also for the substance of the animal, not just for the sport of it. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, meat, meat for me is, I've always said, the number one trophy. Um, I, I like antlers as much as the next guy, but I'm the first one to shoot a doe if it comes by. The first legal animal that comes by is going to get it. Absolutely. Um, because we eat it. And Absolutely. Our family, you know, I've, I've never shot an animal and given it to somebody to just say, oh, here, you know, I don't want to eat it. Like, I prize that. There's people that, you know, I shoot something and they're like, oh, you know, why don't you give us, you know, some of it? Or, you know, can I buy that from you? And I was like, no, this is the, the most prized part of this experience to me is the meat. And, uh, you know, second, of course is the experience and I know at least for me in primitive hunting it was I wanted a way to gain to be able to collect that meat but I also wanted to do it in a fashion that was exceptionally rewarding just going out with a gun and shooting it was more like I say more like work it's it can be for sure if, if that's your only goal is to say well I'm just out to collect meat but if you're trying to blend recreation you know with a practical use you know, for what you're going after, then, you know, you can mix the two. You can make make sure you get the meat, but you can also do it in a, in a fashion that's also very rewarding for you. And, and it's not just, and it's not really, and I don't, I guess that's something too that's often confused. It, it's not the kill that's the important part. It's, it is when you're talking about the meat, but the hunt in general is really the important part. It's a, it's the factor that makes it enjoyable. It's not necessarily the animal dying. It's the fashion in which we were able to do it. Absolutely. The fashion that we were able to do it in. But, Ryan, I know that you've had this feeling when you can take a piece of wood and carve it into a, a tool that can be used, along with the arrow that you make, you nap out the stone point, and to actually be able to take an animal doing that... Um, you just can't, words can't put that in description until you're able to experience that. Um, now, not everyone that chooses to go the primitive journey may choose to create or make their own bow or nap out their points. They may have somebody like yourself that would uh, fashion out these tools for them. But still, being able to do it where you have to get that close to an animal in my shot distance is... I think the, the bull elk that I killed was probably as far as I've ever taken anything with primitive equipment, and he was at 12 yards. So I really like to be within 10 yards. The I, con love, 
Go I ahead. love hearing you say that. Sorry. I just love hearing you say that. I, yeah, I was waiting to hear what that distance was, and you said 12 yards, and it was like, that's it. And that's the yep. that's when you know that somebody is a serious, a, a very serious primitive hunter when they say, well, the longest that I'm shooting is 12 yards. Because I talk to a lot of people, and they're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm shooting a deer at 30 yards, and it's like, you know, I pretty much know right away. It's not that they've never killed a deer or that they're not a serious hunter, but your people that do it time and time and time again will bring that, that distance closer and closer and closer because they know it's not about making, if you, I don't, I'm not even a basketball fan, but it's not about making a three pointer on an animal. You want to basically, when you get close to it, you want to slam dunk it every single time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, we were talking about one of the reasons why we hunt. It's not just, it is the experience for me. It's a part of my heritage for me to connect with my heritage. Um, but also it, it helps sustain our family. Not that we couldn't go to the grocery store and buy the meat, but it certainly means more when you're able to take the animal yourself. But you and I both know, Ryan, we'll use the bones from the animal. We we'll use the hide. Uh, when I hunt, I strictly dress in traditional clothes that I've, made from brain tanning hides um we'll use the hooves of that deer we'll use every part of the animal that we can where most hunters will take the hide and they'll discard the hide or they'll discard the bones so we're trying to um we're doing it as efficiently as possible i guess is what i'm saying ryan yeah absolutely and and one of the things that i do like whenever i have a carcass i have a normal spot that i go dump anything that's left over and basically every summer I go back through and then pick up all the bones that mother nature has cleaned for me and Mm. anything that I can use bone wise of course you know there's not a whole lot you can do with vertebrae and stuff like that but leg bones I mean I split those for fish points Uh, I make a lot of you know stuff out of out of the legs I mean the list can go on and on you can find a flat section um, jaw bones, I feel, make an exceptionally good uh, notching tool in flint napping uh, because they're very, very dense and they're very thin. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely try to use as much as we can. And, and I know that there's always an element of waste, but as you said, as primitive hunters, and we value all those things because essentially our, our tools are made from all those things. So now we've assigned a value to not only the meat, but but the bones and the hide and you know and some animals yeah the sinew 100 percent. i mean i i use so much sinew in making arrows all the time for people um and i'm always heartbroken at the amount of people that throw sinew away and so prized for us and i'm always amazed to see when different people want to look at what i'm doing and my um my sewing kit is uh, a kit with a bone needle, a bone owl, and I can either use sinew or some scraps from the brain tan hides that I've used to sew with. Mm -hmm. So as you said, the list can go on and on. That's right, absolutely. And, And that's something that I really admire about you is that you take it even a step further in many instances than I do. And I think because... It is an occupation for me. Hold on, we're going to crack another beer here quick. Uh, Because I do it for a living, there's a certain amount of time as money. So I can't stop and make everything 100% traditional because you just just can't do it. Um, But when you're doing it solely for personal reasons or recreation like you do, you're able to stop and smell the roses a little bit. And that's something that I wish I actually had a little bit more time to do. Now, when I go do my own personal hunts, one of my favorite things to do is, is nap with Aboriginal tools, you know, and hammer stones and deer antler tools as opposed to copper. And then when it starts getting into the business side of things, I know I can make points a lot faster and cleaner essentially with copper tools and so over time I've had to evolve what I do for customers just to simply get it out the door fast enough but um, not to go on too much of an offshoot on that because I know what a lot of people are thinking I've caught rash from this from folks before where they think that I shouldn't be taking something like this and turning it into profit 
but one thing that is exceptionally important to me is being able to perpetuate the education of this and there's no way to get this in front of people unless you have money to do it absolutely I mean, there, there's not you have to have a platform to stand on and you have to have money to be able to make that happen and the reason I started selling this was selling this stuff in the very beginning none of it went to income all of it was it went right into well now I can go take a hunt and I can do this and now I can write all of this stuff down so I put it in, in my books I put it in in magazine articles trying to get just this information out there from experience and as it got more popular then of course I was able to sell more and then I finally got to a point where I could devote all my time to doing this full time and because of that now I have even more um, leeway with those funds to where now I can go do even bigger and even more things and that and the only reason we're sitting here talking about this today is because we're able to turn it into a financial endeavor and this is how that I support my family is by building bows arrows and stone points um, but I probably put way more back into the business especially with my videos the videos cost me a ton of money that I really don't see a return on but the education to me is exceptionally important you know what's really interesting that you say about that Ryan we don't have elders that we can reach out to and learn this so probably uh, some of my most valuable lessons are not through my successes it's been those times whenever things didn't go exactly the way I wanted them to we would call them failures but I call it learning experiences so I could take that and learn from it now you and I can share with each other and learn from the experiences that we've had and even other people that are either primitive hunters are looking to get into primitive hunting and we can come together and share each other's success and failures to help each other grow and learn. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head right there exactly and that's exactly what this podcast is 100% about. Um, it's to not only be able to use my stuff that I've put out, but I can find folks like you that, that have, that have walked, you know, 10 miles in moccasins to, to know the difficulty and not, it, the story doesn't always have to come from my mouth. I want to collect that data from as many people as possible. And, you know, I know that you've got that to share. So I'm glad that, uh, you know, glad we were able to bring that to light for sure. And I guess with that, I would say let's get on to, I, I really want to hear more about uh, this bear hunt. So you went to Alaska for grizzly bear, correct? That was the, uh, that was the whole f focus of the hunt. And in this particular hunt, I was allowed to, uh, to uh, I was able to take a, uh, a black bear also. But my sole purpose was strictly to try to take a grizzly bear, which almost goes against my grain because for a lot of the tribes it was considered a very sacred animal and uh, so I'll, I had some reservations up front but um, it has been a challenge that um, I just really wanted to um, take on to see if it actually could be done huh well that's that I, and I guess the reason too that you've probably seeking the grizzly bears because like we already discussed you you did already take a black bear so that one's kind of under your belt and you know why not up the challenge a little bit because you were the one that told me how much more difficult it is to take a grizzly bear compared to a black bear and I don't think that that is conveyed as often as it probably should be I think many people are under the understanding that if a grizzly bears there yeah, um, mostly it just wants to come eat you or maul you to death um, or it simply doesn't care that you're there but the truth is quite the opposite is it not absolutely I was told by several people that had hunted the grizzly bear that they were like hunting a 200 inch white tailed deer and I just you know I just could not fathom that and um, I would certainly amen that that their their sense of smell their awareness is unbelievable 
So if you're able to get within close range on a grizzly bear, whether it's spot and stalk or baiting has been made legal in Alaska within the jet, just the last recent years, um, they are still a very wary animal. They don't pattern very easy. Like a black bear, they come in, you can pattern them, they're going to come in every day. The grizzly bear is just the opposite. He roams. He may be at one place today, and he'll be at another place three miles or five miles further than where that spot is at. So they're just a very difficult animal to hunt. Hmm. Yeah, that's... uh... I don't even have a response to that, honestly. <laughs> uh, it's definitely, to me, that was, in in my mind, especially growing up, I always wanted to get a grizzly bear. And, uh, of course, as I've gotten a little bit older and a little bit slower and, and a little, uh, um, I guess, concerned for my safety as to the point of, you know, hey, I've got a couple kids now and a wife and my family's going pretty good, Um I don't necessarily want to go put myself in danger over a grizzly bear, uh, you know, because that's because I'm not familiar with them. I've never been there. I've never seen one uh, live in person. But, you know, when you watch TV, you know how everything's always blown up. But, of course, that makes perfect sense that they're not always, you know, if they would just stand there and let you get up close, well, then, you know, obviously that's it's not as much of a challenge. But if they're very hard to get, that kind of shows you that, And not to say that it's not dangerous, but it's not like just because you see one, it's going to come maul you. I mean, obviously your, your sows with the cubs are going to be your most dangerous ones for sure. Um, But much like pig hunting, I guess, well, think about this. People always will post on my video when I killed the, uh, the pig with the atlatl and they're like, you're crazy. And, you know, did you do that with a, with a, a backup gun or anything like that? No, you know, it's like these pigs aren't out to get you. Like TV is the one that, that tells you. You know, if you, you know, even get within sight of a pig, it's going to come, like, charge you and run you over. And it's like, that that doesn't happen. If they would do that, they would make our life a lot easier. <laughs> but they run away They, they run away from you. And, and I guess, you know, it's easy to get caught up in whatever, you know, the, the big TV networks tell you uh, about it. And I guess Grizzly Bear would then be the same way. I mean, certainly you need to be careful, but... It's not like you're just going to put yourself in horrible danger just by showing up. And- no, absolutely. It's the opposite. Um, and I think there's where areas that bear become used to humans. That's whenever you're inviting danger. But animals are just like humans. They also have different personalities. Um, black bear especially. You may see one black bear and he gets a, a view of you and he's gone where I've actually had black bear, and I've always hunted on the ground. So I'll build ground blinds wherever I'm hunting at. And I've had several black bear try to crawl up in the ground blind with me. I've actually reached out and touched them with my arrow. So that was just the personality of that black bear. He was curious. Yeah. And um, specific species have certain personality traits, but they're individual animals also. And you may have one grizzly that is more on the aggressive side where you have another grizzly that's not quite as aggressive. But you also have to understand too, they're at the top of the food chain. They have to have a certain personality to be able to predator to be able to be a predator that they are. So that's always in mind and I was told, never get between a cub and a sow. That's when you're inviting danger. Yep, that makes perfect sense. So and if if nobody's ever seen my WAP stick video that I did it sounds like a feller needs a whap stick for when them bear try to climb into your, your blind. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Crack them with one of those. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us, tell me a little bit more about um, your actual hunt. And, and really what I want you to do is just go ahead, start from the beginning and just tell us the story. Let's just go right into it and, you know, from when you got there and started, set the scene, and then finish it out with, you know, wherever you see fit to stop. Yeah. So this particular hunt was scheduled to be a 10-day hunt, Ryan. Um, In Alaska, you cannot legally hunt grizzly bear uh, as a non-resident without a guide. So I had to use an outfitter, and um, I did have an agreement up front with the outfitter that 
there's no way that he would be able to shoot the animal that I was hunting unless he was physically chewing on me. That's just something that was really important to me. So um, I hunted several days before I actually was able to see a grizzly bear. And uh, here's something else that's really interesting about a grizzly bear. A black bear will sneak up on you just like a white-tailed deer, and you'll never hear them. Hear them. They just automatically they appear. A grizzly bear is completely opposite. You can hear this animal coming through the woods. He's crashing and breaking stuff. And the first one that I saw was a actually a sow and the cub. And remember, I went in and I built ground blinds. And uh, these are this is a baited hunt. And so I heard this sow coming through the woods, and it honestly almost sounded like a freight train. She's huffing and puffing. I, I didn't know what it was at first. So the sow comes in, she backs out, the cub comes in, what we would call a cub. It was about a year and a half old cub, and he was actually almost the size of a decent black bear. The uh, cub eats for a little bit, the sow comes back in, and they both leave. So at this point, I'm within seven yards of the first grizzly bear that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I can't describe it, there's just no words that can put in description what that was like, Ryan. Man, my, my heart kind of pounded a little bit hearing you tell yeah. the story. <laughs> Unbelievable. Man, so, yeah, that's, that's intense. Further into the hunt, I think I was about probably on day eight, and I had decided, you know, if I, if I get a decent black bear that's going to come in, um, I was going to try to take the, the black bear. And um, I'm going to write an article in Bear Hunting Magazine, and probably give more of the full details of the hunt. But this particular black bear was a good-sized bear. It uh, was a cinnamon-colored, which is something I was looking for, was a color-faced bear. And um, I shot this bear the first time, and it ran up a tree, probably 20 feet up a tree. And I thought, you know, um, I didn't get the hit that I wanted to. So... um, thought well maybe we'll wait for this bear to come down i waited probably 30 minutes the bear didn't give any sign that it was going to come down the tree so i said well maybe i can go up there was a tree that was probably within six or eight yards of the tree that the black bear was in and i saw a limb that i thought that i could get up to and kind of stand on that limb that was pretty level with the black with the with the bear and uh so i got up to the limb and it just wasn't quite as sturdy as i wanted to be so i come down and I found a small hole that I felt I could um, could get an arrow through. And um, this is a testament of the equipment that we use, not the hunter, but the equipment. Um, I was able to slip an arrow through the hole. The black bear was kind of leaning down towards me. So it was a black bear and like a deer, you don't want to hit them right behind the shoulder. There's a saying when you're hunting bear, it's called the middle of the middle. Middle ways back from the shoulder, middle way down. That's where their vitals lie. So I made a perfect shot, and uh, the arrow stuck out the other side, probably, I don't know, two or three inches. The bear fell, got up, walked a few steps, and that's where it expired at. So that was the, um, that was the animal I actually took on the hunt. On day 10 of the hunt, um, we felt that there was a grizzly bear coming into a specific spot, we go in, we set everything up, and I'm actually setting four yards from where this bear was was baited at. And um, I heard the bear come in, made just a, a, a whooping sound. It came in, and the best words that I could describe, Ryan, is this bear acted like he was on crack. He wasn't. He couldn't sit still. He was looking. He was moving. I thought, there's no way that I can get a shot on this animal. He stayed probably two or three minutes, and he was gone. I thought, well, this is over. And uh, 20 minutes later, looked like the same size bear, but completely different personality. This bear comes in quiet like a black bear. He comes in. He's just as calm as a black bear. I watched this bear for probably 10 minutes at four yards. Now, remember, I'm hunting on the ground, so I built a good ground blind 
with a small hole that I could shoot through. And um, how big bear, was was this one? You think? Um, he was probably we estimated him somewhere between seven and seven and a half feet. Wow. Um, you said something earlier. It's not the size of the animal for me. Correct. It's never been about the size. It's been about the blessing of being able to harvest an animal, whether it's if it's a whitetail, if it's a doe, if it's a small buck. I'm like everybody else. I like antlers, but it's just the ability to be able to take an animal with something that you've made yourself. It so, is. Uh, a, a yearling deer, not to cut you off, but but to emphasize that, uh, even to kill a, a yearling deer, a button buck, with a primitive bow, is can can turn that into the trophy of a lifetime. And that's something that I've always said. And I think it's because I, I grew up in an area that wasn't covered up in big bucks. But I would value any animal that I got an incredible amount. But anyway, go ahead back to your... Yeah, Story. absolutely, and I'll kind of tell that is if the animal's legal, and you're able to harvest that animal, it um, that's a trophy. So uh, this grizzly bear finally gets in a broadside position, and uh, he pulls his front leg way up. And I thought, okay, this is it. Then he brings it way back, brings it right back. So I wait another couple, three minutes, and when he lifts his leg up again, where I was at a good shot at his vitals, um, I hit him at a perfect spot. And what we had determined, and um, the guy that was with me has this on video, it sounded like that I hit a rib bone, and I didn't get probably three inches of penetration, but it didn't seem that way from where we were at. So this bear takes off, he runs over a small ridge, and we both thought that he was going to be just lying there just a few yards over this ridge. So we get, we're sitting there standing, giving him about 30, 45 minutes to, uh, before we go look. And probably 20 minutes, we're standing there talking, and I would say maybe an eight, eight and a half foot gorgeous grizzly bear walks up on us within 20 yards. And we heard this bear come crashing through. It finally gets a, a whiff of us, and it takes off. End of the story. We go look for the bear that I had shot. And uh, over the ridge, probably 30 or 40 yards, we find my arrow. And uh, it had probably up to three inches of blood on it. So I know that I didn't get the penetration that I needed. Um, the bear wasn't harmed that bear will live on he'll heal up very quickly which is something if i'm not going to get an animal i don't want to wound an animal where it's going to suffer but right at the end of the day we realize that this is hunting too they call it hunting for a reason not killing and uh, unfortunately sometimes that is part of hunting where we don't get that perfect shot right in this instance it was the perfect shot but it wasn't the penetration that i needed so this animal's going to live on. He'll probably, um, hopefully he'll father, you know, a bunch of bears in the future. And uh, if God's will, um, I hope and pray that I'm able to um, have that experience again. Yeah, I hope you do. I hope you get back out there and, uh, and definitely get another shot at one. And that's something, too, that I've experienced with this, and I've said it many times over, is that this primitive gear does not perform it can perform as well as some more modern gear but when you talk about shooting you know metal broadheads even from like a fiberglass traditional bow that's a completely different animal than shooting a wooden primitive bow with a stone point and it takes a lot more energy to get that penetration but once you get that penetration it will do as much damage as anything. If you pass through those vitals, it will cut them up and they'll bleed out exceptionally fast. So there's always that, those people that be like, well, you know, that's a long, you know, horrible death for an animal to be shot with a stone point. It's not, because if you get in there, it's it's done and over. Uh, typically, if I shoot something, I watch them fall. Um, but it's more difficult for sure to get the arrow 
into them. Now, and I will say this, I am a firm believer that if you shoot a deer with a metal point and that point stays in it, say like it, it jams into like a fin on the uh, spine mm-hmm. and doesn't penetrate and then breaks off, that is far more likely to get infected because that metal oxidizes and that animal stands a lot higher chance of dying if you shoot something with a completely organic shaft with and then you know with pine pitch glue sinew and a stone arrowhead there is nothing to oxidize and it heals over very very fast i actually shot a deer one time in montana and hit it high um kind of in that high scapula area and it stopped and broke the point off in it. And that same deer came by, and this was actually a yearling doe, came by. So you think, you know, this would be a weaker animal to begin with. Uh, this same deer came by four or five days later, completely healed over. You could see the scar. I ended up shooting that deer again and killing it and going in. And, and that deer was completely healed over, fine, no sign of infection whatsoever. Wow. And, and uh, and and I am a, a firm believer in that. I've actually shot now, believe it or not, a couple deer with stone points. I'm never afraid to say this because it happens. That's part of hunting. People lose game when they're shooting it with rifles and shooting it with compounds, especially when people are shooting way too far, especially shooting compounds. Oh, we're going to shoot, you know, 80 yards. Well, you see on TV, yeah, they, they get them all every time. Well, you know, Joe, you know, Joe down the road, he goes down and, and shoot stuff at 80 yards and all too often he got shoots it or hits a shoulder blade or whatnot doesn't recover it and the deer runs off and there's a decent chance that it died sometimes not they can recover but I've actually shot a few deer now that I have shot previously not gotten the penetration because I've either hit high on the spine but not actually penetrated or broken the spine or uh, hit the scapula and they've actually healed over I shot a buck just a couple uh, two years ago now, shot a, a non-typical 10-point, and the one horn was really, really goofy, and when I skinned it out, there was a very defined slit and a scar right high on its left shoulder, and I started thinking, going, I know exactly what that is, I've shot that deer before, and I thought back to it, and less than a 100 yards from where I killed that deer, I thought back to old two years I think it was prior two or three years prior I couldn't re- couldn't remember exactly which one I had shot a very small spike and hit it right right high in that same exact spot and I guarantee you that that is the same deer that I had shot those couple wow. years earlier and obviously it was completely fine I mean it's it's antler was messed up but other than that you know that's the only only thing but you could actually after all that time, it was healed that way. You could actually put your finger all the way to the bone and feel that the bone was deformed where I hit the bone with wow. your finger, which was amazing. That you could still do it after that many years. That it just healed that way, and there was a channel there. Hmm. But that deer was perfectly fine. So yeah, no doubt in my mind, you shot that grizzly, hit a hit a rib, and that grizzly is fine to this day. Yeah, and I tell you, you make an interesting point. Um, the first black bear that I killed was up in Alberta, Canada. And, um, someone in bear camp told me after I had killed the bear, he said, RD, I looked at your equipment and I, I said, I got to be honest with you. I didn't think it would work. I just did not think it would work. Right conditions, right distance. It's very effective. It's extremely effective. Is it? Is it, is it like modern equipment? Absolutely not. Absolutely. But the black bear that I killed in Canada, that black bear, it fell out of the tree, got up and walked probably 10 yards, and it's like you had just taken a bucket of blood and just poured out on the ground from where it got up and started walking to where it lay down and, and, and died. So it's extremely effective. When you put the air in the right place, the conditions are right, you're at the right distance. Is this something that you want to try to shoot an animal at 20 plus yards? Absolutely not. But given our limitations, 
It's a very, very effective. It is how my ancestors survived in all of primitive man before we came here. How they survived is how they fed themselves, Ryan. Yep. And it actually reminds me there there was, and I don't I don't remember who did it. Um, what other podcast it was that was talking about uh, traditional hunters in general saying that they don't limit themselves saying you know they were all just like ah you know they say they only shoot 20 yards but when they have that big bucket 40 yards you know they shoot at it and uh, I'm try- I don't know who it was but a friend of mine sent it to me and honestly I didn't even listen to it because if you have to explain it to people they just don't understand anyway um, but when it comes to primitive hunters people you know like you and I that, that do it all the time you know we've taken a lot of animals doing it um, you know, and if that big buck walks out at 30 yards, if I've got no problem letting it go. Like, that's not an issue. In fact, I found it, <laughs> uh, you know, this year I had a boar that walked by at 15 yards, and it gave me a shot, but it didn't give me the shot that I wanted. And I actually let it go and came back and ended up shooting it with a flintlock uh, a couple months later, and that's in the flintlock boar hunt video that I did, and um, and I'll even put a link to that down in the show notes for anybody that wants to go watch it, because I've always stood by the idea that if you shoot one and lose it today, you're probably never going to get it, or you've just educated that animal, and you're not going to shoot it ever again. So you either shoot it and lose it today, and it's gone forever, or let it go by, and you stand another chance it's alive and well to hunt it again tomorrow. Absolutely. And you know, um, two of the biggest bucks that I've seen in my area, um, I've actually let those deer walk. And they were both within well within range. One was at probably six yards. The other one was at maybe eight yards. But they did not present that shot that I was comfortable with. So um, I've had numerous times probably have let more animals walk past than I've actually taken because of not having that that ideal shot Um, maybe within range but didn't present the shot that I felt comfortable with Ryan absolutely I've had uh, deer come in especially in my youth when I was still thinking that if I shot a heavier bow or whatever that I could force it I could force a bad shot and of course that was just being young and dumb uh, and in experience for that matter and I tried to force shots I never had a single forced shot actually work out in my favor I don't think I've ever had one but if I wait for that absolutely perfect shot 10 yards and in 12 yards is a little bit on the on the long side for me and I have shot deer farther I absolutely have but if I wait for that perfect shot very rarely am I let down very rarely absolutely absolutely and uh the other point that you made too if this animal walks today good lord's will i'll have another opportunity to hunt that animal tomorrow mm-hmm. and he may present that great that perfect shot or that shot that i'm comfortable with and i'll be able to take the animal versus as you said when we were younger we may have forced something but um primitive hunting teaches me to wait for the right opportunity. If it doesn't come, there's a tomorrow. That's right. Absolutely. And if you don't mind me asking, um, well, I know you don't mind me asking, but for the sake of data, you know, we're talking about you didn't penetrate the grizzly bear, correct? But then with the same stuff, you did penetrate the black bear. So you're talking about a a different size animal, of course. Did you hit a a rib going into the black bear or no? No. Uh -uh. Okay didn't hit a rib going in and um on the previous one of the previous black bear hunts the one in canada um it seems like there was a rib that i probably um had some contact with um but it wasn't a dead on hit this grizzly bear from the the way the point looked broke broke off the tip uh, the sound of it it just sounded like it was just a dead impact real bone where others maybe had some contact um actually in in canada i killed two black bear within 30 minutes of each other and uh one of them 
was uh, the biggest one that I killed on that trip. Probably it was over a 300 pound bear, which is a it's a pretty decent sized bear. And uh, penetration, the, um, the point sticking out, um, touching the hide on the other side. So as long as we get to the vital vitals, Ryan, that's what matters. Right. Yeah. I didn't know actually know that you'd shot multiple black bears. So that's that's good to know as well. But uh, anyway, I was thinking, you know, but you were on this hunt in particular, you were shooting even a sinew bowstring, correct? Yes, yeah. correct. Yes, sure was. And um, and sinew ahead. strings can definitely will definitely slow down bow's performance compared to a modern you know day you know dacron string or even a fast flight string obviously. So you're you're slowing down the energy of the bow. But and 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 the point to mention in that is that that is much closer to off. I mean that or is an exact match, if not much closer, to authentic. This is what the primitive peoples hunted with, and these are the same problems that they would have ran into. They didn't have the opportunity to just say, oh, well, I didn't work that time, so I'm going to I'm gonna use a Dacron string next try, next time. So, I mean, they shot sinew strings, dugbane strings, rawhide strings, and those perform significantly less than modern strings. And that's another really important factor to keep in mind along with the fact that stone points simply do not penetrate as well as steel if you would have hit that in your mind from your experience if you would have hit that rib with a steel point would there be a dead grizzly at the end of the story more than likely there probably could have been ryan Right, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't take anything away from your experience though, because oh no, because yeah, I mean if you shot it with a with a steel point, I mean you'd have got it, and and there's certain circumstances you would have been stoked about it, but I know that you're a lot like me, and if you don't get it done the way that you want to get it done, that'll weigh on you forever. Like you, this is this is the way you want to do it, and it means something really important to you to do it that way, and you'd rather not do it at all than then half ass your way into it absolutely it is um at the end of the day for me just being able to have that kind of an experience ryan to be four yards on a grizzly bear and him never know that you were there it's um it's undescribable again being able to hunt the animals like i do gives me just a tiny glimpse of how my people lived mm-hmm but it didn't work out exactly the way I wanted it to. I feel very blessed just to be able to do that hunt. And uh, if the Lord's will, I'll get an opportunity to do it again somewhere down the road. If not, I feel great about just having the experience riding. Yeah, that's that's for sure. I mean, the experience is the is really you know <laughs> the most important part in that for sure. When I went and, and did the elk hunt last year, I never expected that I would get an elk, and I did. But I just, I, I said I didn't care, you know, it was just the experience of going and doing it, that was the important part. If I saw elk, if I got close, it was still going to be a success just because I went and did it, um, you know, and of course I was very fortunate in that hunt. But uh, let me ask you this, just for the sake of data, um, do you, how big was the point, the stone point that you were shooting? You know, on this hunt, um, I went with a little bit larger tip than I normally do, uh, trying to create some more of the forward weight on the end of my arrow. Uh, there's some th- some techniques that I use also to uh, get the weight of my arrow up, um, and I think you do the same thing also. I've actually taken a flint drill and drilled into the um, nodes of my river cane, which is the, mm-hmm. the shaft of the arrow. And I filled it with sand and then covered that back up with pine pitch and yeah. then wrapped that with sinew. So it's to give me forward weight and bring the tip of the. But I'm normally I'll shoot probably an 80 uh, grain tip. And this probably might have been maybe a 100 grain tip, maybe just a tad over. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, of course, I, I don't know how much you've actually followed the stuff that I talk about, but I'm always standing around preaching about shooting smaller points because they simply they penetrate better Um, absolutely and you know when you get the larger like you said you want to put more weight in the front of the arrow and so you end up finding yourself conflicted going well i want to shoot 
more weight up front so I need a bigger stone point but at least from my experience I've found that the resistance actually outweighs the benefits of the weight so I've finally gotten to a point where I say I don't care how much weight that I have up front as long as I have less resistance going in I've actually I've never not killed an animal from over penetrating but I've certainly lost animals by not penetrating enough and so because of that I've found that at least personally it's been more important for me to take make a very low profile point even if it's lighter just to get that initial penetration now of course since doing that and I like that 80 grain range that you were talking about in fact a lot of people call me and they're like oh I want 125 or even people are like I want to I shoot 200 grain broadheads I want a 200 grain stone point and I'm like man you're you're gonna get about half of that stone point into that animal and it's not even gonna go past that um, you know, stone is much lighter than steel, and so when people think, oh, you're shooting an 80 grain stone point, to me, that's actually a pretty big one, um, you know, 50, 60 grain, historically, you're looking at those little bird points where you're, you know, th those are like 20 to 30 grain points, and those were really to kill the bigger animals, for sure, because the smaller points penetrate further. And that's a great point, and a lot of my animals, Ryan, if you look at the point, you would call it a bird point, mm -hmm. but we probably know that's a that's a true arrowhead. When somebody finds what they consider an arrowhead, they probably found an atlata point. One hundred percent, I agree with that. If if you find a big point and it's got notches on it, it's an atlata point for sure. Absolutely. If you find a tiny triangle that's the size of your fingernail, it's got no notches, that's actually an arrowhead. Absolutely. Um, and that that fact is lost on so many people um, there's just so much confusion on that when you consider what people shoot traditional archery and they want to shoot 125 grain point and that's like the lightest that they want to go um, you know because you think there's all this information out there about front of center penetrating better which is which is really true um, but when the resistance is so high you can't get that initial penetration so that's that's for me why I've always shot smaller points and I know uh, having like a really sharp needle tip as opposed to like rounded fronts like people will find artifacts that have slightly rounded fronts and I think you know not to get onto the archaeological side of things but I think those are ones that weren't actually sharpened yet ready to hunt with they were more mounted and preformed and then when they're ready to hunt, they're going to go ahead and ship that very needle sharp tip on there. Because it's easy to bust that little needle sharp tip off. It's easier to leave it blunt for now, and we'll sharpen it later. So people try to reverse engineer, and they find a point, and they're like, well, this was put on an arrow. And it's like, well, number one, no, it was really, it was probably put on an atlatl. And number two, they're like, well, it's this big blunted front. So they obviously had no problem, you know, getting penetration on an animal. But I completely disagree with that, given all the animals that I've you know driven a stone point into I've actually bounced blunt nosed points off of deer like shot them and had them bounce back to me because they would not penetrate and that's coming off of like a 60 pound bow shooting a Dacron bowstring um, mm. so it's it's all that data from my earlier you know, failures, if you if you want to call them that, have taught me small points, very needle sharp tips, and get that arrow as is the arrow as heavy as you can, but not necessarily the point. I, I'd rather shoot even if I don't care about that FOC stuff. You know, the front of center weight. If I can shoot a 550, 600 grain arrow, that's fine. With a, I don't care if it's got 30 grains of stone point on the front as long as the arrow weighs 500 plus grains I'm perfectly good with that absolutely you're exactly right and one of the things that you just mentioned you're you're able to you're able to use this information not based on theory not from a point that you pick up and look at and think well maybe it was used like this it's because of the experience that you've had that's what enables you to say all right the blunt tip probably no matter what bow weight that you're going to use, it's not going to work, Ryan. You need that needle sharp tip on that arrow. Least resistance that you can. And obviously, we want to make nice looking bows. You can make an ugly looking bow, but spend a lot of time on your arrow. Make sure that you're getting as much energy as possible. 
needle point tip and that's what's going to enable you to take that animal yeah the arrow is, is really the the champion in this it's not the bow now you, you just do need to have a bow that that shoots relatively hard when you talk about all the books or whatever that said that people were shooting you know through one bison and into the next one with a 40 pound bow um uh, that's not it's not happening and i I, no. I know from experience um it's not happening like i will literally call somebody a liar to their face even if you shoot one in the guts you're going to be hard pressed to actually get out the other side of a bison with a 40 pound bow i don't care if you're shooting no point at all um just simply because there's the energy is not there no matter right. what i'm telling you from experience being ultra close on a bison bison shooting a 60 pound bow you're not going to get that type of penetration i don't care where you hit that animal at not using stone points it's just not going to happen so the arrow is the champion but you got to also have the bow that's going to produce that energy or it's not going to happen either yep i come 100 percent 100 percent agree and that's what i've been spending the last several several years on is getting to a point where because people that that want to do this and they don't want to build their own stuff or they're not to that point or even if they do want to build their own stuff they're not able to wrap their head around what it actually takes to penetrate and that's the whole purpose of the videos, of the articles, of this new podcast series starting is to educate people. You can do this. And you can even kill a deer with a great big point. You could put a 200 grain point on there and slip between a rib and kill that deer. But to reliably do it time after time after time again, you're eventually going to learn that you need as little resistance as possible, as much weight in the arrow as possible, and as much speed in the bow as possible. And the more primitive you get, the tougher that is to actually achieve. And point in that is um, I just did a video uh, where I killed a pig on public land, and the video is actually doing really good, which is great if you've not seen it. Um, it's the bushcraft bow and builder, the bushcraft build, build a bow and then hunt a pig uh, video. And I'll put a link down to that in the show notes too. But that bow, I did also previous videos on penetration testing. And that is a very, it's a straight limbed, long hardwood bow that is an incredibly close rendition, if you will, of what a real primitive bow is. And it has a rawhide string on it. And that bow is actually really slow. And that's the truth behind authentic primitive archery is you don't have these speed demon bows like we can build today. So you come to me and you order a custom bow, um, you know, one of my modern primitive models that I make. You're going to have some slightly recurved tips. You're going to have a modern string. You're going to have everything you can to basically be shooting, you know, 150 160 170 occasionally up to 180 feet per second and i mean these arrows are clipping along fast shooting off these modern bows but if you're shooting a real primitive bow with a real primitive string they just do not perform very well and i was shooting these tiny little bird points very small and I was not happy with the penetration that I was even getting from that. And you're talking about a bow that's about 58 pounds at my draw length and um, still not penetrating. I did a penetration test on a boar's shield and the metal point went through it. No problem. Had no problem going through the boar's shield. But when I even when I shot that little stone point, it wouldn't penetrate. Um, and everybody's like, well, you got to shoot a bigger head because it's the weight. And it's not. When I showed that in the atlatl uh, penetration test, you'd have a bigger point, and it completely stops it. You won't get any penetration whatsoever. It's all resistance. It's not the, it's not energy at that point. That resistance actually um, outweighed the energy, if you will. Um, and I wasn't, to be honest, comfortable even shooting, from my experience, shooting many animals with stone points off this very authentic bow with a primitive string. I was like... 
If I get a young pig, yes, I will penetrate. But if I get a bigger, older pig, I'm not going to get this point into it and kill it. And I was kind of on crunch time because crunch time, I really wanted to get this video done. So I opted to use a, a handmade, you know, metal point that I had actually banged out of a uh, out of a spoon and ground it into a point and even shooting a metal point down through the back of the pig and I was only about six yards from it it didn't even penetrate out the bottom of the pig and that tells you how real primitive bows actually perform which you know makes it sound bad it's like oh you make a slow bow and it's like no I made an authentic bow, <laughs> and it performed in an authentic, on an authentic manner, um, compared to in that same penetration test video, where I took a modern, one of my modern self bows, if you will, and a smaller point, you know, in a, in a cane arrow, and I was able to shoot right through that same shield that the authentic bow s stopped. So when you go back to talking about your grizzly bear hunt, and that you you know, shot this with a wooden bow with a sinew string, you know, and a primitive arrow and a stone point. It's not a surprise to me at all that the rib stopped it because that's a fact of life. But that's also what makes this so challenging, but also so rewarding when you actually get it done. Yeah. You know, it kind of takes us back to our original conversation about I may take a yearling button buck or a small yearling doe. If you if you look back in time when they were hunting the bisons on the plain, they were they're targeting the cows, not the large bull, for a couple of reasons, I believe. Number one, they're not as big an animal. Mm -hmm. Number two, the bull is what was mean, so they <laughs> were targeting the cow. So if we're in a true primitive situation where our survival depends upon this i'm not going after the big buck that's with the big body i'm going to target that smaller animal and know that i'm going to get the penetration that i need and have a better result and still get meat absolutely positively yeah but you know if they're in a situation where they have an opportunity that bigger animal they're certainly going to take it too but that also comes at the at the cost that they may not get the penetration but as you find at least through the archaeological record, when you like look at an Overstreet manual, the points get smaller and smaller and smaller um, in modern times, and that's because they were shooting them off bows instead of atlatls. So if you follow Absolutely. the trail and you know what you're looking at, because not because of theory, but because of actual practical application, building atlatls, building bows, and shooting stuff, and not the modern interpretations as much as the authentic ones you can easily come to the conclusion that hey we're we're getting down to shooting these tiny tiny little points and and, and then somebody would say well why even shoot a point at all instead of a sharpened wooden stick but a sharpened wooden stick simply does not again it can't break that seal of the skin like a very hard tip of a piece of stone. So all you have to do is have the tiniest little tip on that piece of stone to initiate that cut and the rest of the arrow can follow in. But that's why you have to have that needle tip. Um, and then as you go back further in time, what I've noticed at least through looking at you know the carbon dating when they compare organics found in the same uh, level of sediment, as uh, the points that they recover is the atlatl points were larger but only after uh, the ice age and after the megafauna went extinct so when you get back to true paleo times you're finding where the points are actually really small now of course you find a lot of bifaced points if you want to call them that say like clovis or agate basins and they're very large and people think oh they killed a bison or they killed a a, a, mam a mammoth with this but in reality that's more of a skinning blade and then as it got sharpened down then later it got repurposed to a projectile but uh, um, at least around here over in the silver river they uh, excavated a Colombian mammoth and it was a calf at that and they were able to recover a stone point that was used to kill that calf. And it was a, an extremely small point, much like we would look at like an arrow point 
like a bird point for an arrow, and it was used on the end of an atlatl because they knew that that was the only thing that they would actually be able to penetrate such a large animal, and that was a calf mammoth. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, go back in uh, some of the mounds that have been excavated and dug, the points that they've dug out of these mounds, the Cahokia mounds, uh, they're, they're not large points, Ryan. They're very small, needle-sharp tips, to get just like you said to get that initial penetration and the rest of it's going to follow yep absolutely and in a small tip you know most states regulations you know they say well the point has to be seven eighths of an inch wide which is wonderful you know if you're talking about metal points and you know your average public are not excellent trailers you know if they lose blood it's it's over for them they just give up and walk away and and i don't disagree with the law the way that it's written because it it helps people recover their game um but to think that oh i need a, a stone point that's an inch or an inch and a half wide because it's gonna leave more blood is, is actually hurting you in the long run compared to if you shot one that say was only like a half inch wide really is going to penetrate so good and if you run that literally run that half inch point through the lungs that deer will be dead inside of 50 yards every single time without Absolutely. a doubt without a doubt but uh it may not leave much blood but you'll watch it fall. But, yep. you know, we could get into that conversation. I mean, I could talk about that. Oh, man, for shoot another two hours, I bet. But <laughs> maybe but anyway. that's another future. Uh, maybe that's another future podcast podcast. It is. It absolutely is. And uh, we're going to we're going to do another one. Um, we're going to have you on again for sure uh, in this. I mean, you got to figure the people that we're talking to. There's not a whole lot of them. We're going to have a lot of repeats, and I'm perfectly okay with that because there's lessons to be learned in every hunting story, and we learned a lot in this one, a ton. I even learned stuff about grizzly bears that I never knew, um, and even about the Cherokee and the and the black bear and, and that importance to that culture. Uh, I mean, there's always something to learn, so I mean, I look forward to having you on again and maybe we'll talk about your bison hunt because we started to just touch on that a little bit and that might be something that you know we're we're interested in in going and doing um soon that's uh, leaked a little bit of information there i guess <laughs> but we'll uh you know get back together and let's talk about that one on another episode sounds great ryan and um i just want to put this out there also I've watched a lot of your YouTube and, and the uh, stuff that you put out, and we can learn from each other. I've learned things. Learning how to build the sinew string was off of your YouTube channel. Is that right? I watched, <laughs> absolutely. I watched you build the, the uh, sinew string. So I built my sinew string, and I killed my first animal with it. In Idaho, it was actually a cinnamon-colored black bear, and uh, it performed great. It was wow. wonderful. That's great. So, that's uh, great to know. You're, you're actually going to like one of my future videos here that's going to be coming out. And shoot, actually, by the time anybody hears the podcast, that video may actually be out, but it's probably not. Mm -hmm. um, is I'm doing a rawhide string, and I know we had talked about the sinew string prior to that, and I was trying to get it as thin as I could. And I've, I think I'm actually happier now with my rawhide string than I ever was with my sinew string. And that's oh, wow. that's kind of hard to believe. So I did a video on building a three-ply rawhide string, and it's actually different than I've seen everybody else do it. Um, and it's still, it's not like a speed demon, but I'm not able to break it. It's really, really tough. So we're, we'll cover that again, of course. You know, in the future, there'll be a video of that. People can actually watch me do that one, and I know that you'll check that one out too. But I, I enjoy that that little tidbit of information that you learned the, the sinew string from from watching me. Yeah, absolutely. And you had said something earlier in the cast. Um, I'm able to do this as more of a recreational, from a recreational standpoint, but I have such a great amount of respect doing it as much as you do. You're going to be able to experience maybe some of the things that maybe I haven't had the time to experience. So you can take that information, put it out there, allow people to learn from that and uh, sharing that there's not that many of us and um, I actually told one of your customers the other day they had reached out to me and had heard about my grizzly bear hunt and I said you know we need to stick together we need to share as much as this information that we can so we help each other out in our successes and our failures absolutely 
a hundred percent. I mean, because not I, one person can't can't learn it all and and teach it all. And as much as I do, I still there's still things that I'm learning every year. And I'm always going to be humble enough to say that I don't know all the answers. And there's a lot of things that I've experienced. But when you talk to other people and 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 learn what has worked for them and what hasn't all the pieces start coming together and that's the important part and of course that's that's the essence of this this whole podcast so i really appreciate you coming on and talking to us and i know that we'll have you back and we'll be talking to you really soon again for sure great it's been a pleasure and uh look forward to doing this again ryan all right well sounds good all right well bye for now and uh, and if you haven't subscribed to our channel you might as well go ahead and do it because we're going to have lots more awesome stuff coming up in the future. I am sure of it. So we will catch you on the next one.